Here are the most important formulas you must know before the ANCH. Starting off with geometry, complementary angles are a pair of angles that sum to 90 degrees. Supplementary angles are a pair of angles that sum to 180 degrees, and this generally happens on a line. For example, these two angles are supplementary and sum to 180. When two lines intersect, vertical angles, which are basically these two angles, are equal, and we also have that these two angles are equal because they're both vertical angles. So whenever you have intersecting lines, we have this angle, the, the opposite angles are equal. Now we're going to move on to parallel line angles. So if we have two parallel lines, these two for example, and we have a line cutting through them like this, then we would have that this angle is equal to this angle over here. And notice that at each of these intersection points, we can also derive many other angle relationships by vertical angles and also by supplementary angles. And we would derive that if you look at this diagram, you can find that all the A angles marked are equal to each other and all the B angles marked are equal to each other by the parallel line condition and the supplementary and vertical angles. Next up is inscribed angle theorem. So let's say you have an inscribed angle in a circle like this. This angle over here is half the angle of the inscribed arc. And the inscribed arc is just the, the arc over here. So this is the inscribed arc for this circle. So this angle over here is half the angle of the arc. And what is the angle of the arc? The angle of the arc is just the angle it forms at the center of the circle, like that. So in angle choosing problems, oftentimes the key idea is just to assign variables to some angle and then using the properties we've learned, just go along finding all the angles in terms of that variable and then solve a simple equation. So set variables for angles you don't know and then just use these properties to find equations. And circles are also very useful like inscribed angle theorem. And there's a cool trick you can do is if you have a regular polygon, sometimes drawing a circle around it can help because now you can use the inscribed arc theorem. And there's also a right, ang right angle tangency point. So if we have a circle and then we connect the radius and we, and we have a tangent line, and remember tangent is just a line that touches the circle at exactly one point. It's known that if you draw the radius and draw the radius from the center of the circle to the point of tangency, this angle will be 90 degrees. Now polygons. The sum of the interior angles of a polygon with n sides, so for example, in a pentagon, there's five sides, so n equals five. So the sum of the interior angles is n minus two times 180, and the interior angle of a regular polygon is n minus two divided by n times 180. The exterior angle of a regular polygon is 360 by n. So for example, in a hexagon, the exterior angle, and what is an exterior angle? The exterior angle, let's say we have a hexagon like this, and it's regular. The exterior angle is this angle over here. And because it's a hexagon with six sides, it's just 360 divided by six or 60. So this angle is 60 over here. And this is true for any n. And there's a table here you can review, which can be helpful to memorize the interior angles of different regular polygons with different sides. But all these are derived from this formula. Moving on to the area of a triangle. Now, most of you probably know the simplest way to find the area of a triangle half times base times height. But that's not the only way to find the area of a triangle. You won't always have the height of a triangle. Sometimes you'll only have the three sides. And in that case, you'll have to use Heron's formula. So the area of a triangle with three sides, if we have a triangle, let's say like this, and we don't know the height, we just know three sides. We can't use half the h, of course. So we have to use Heron's formula. And to do Heron's formula, what we do is we find the semi-perimeter and the semi-perimeter is just the perimeter, so a plus b plus c divided by 2. So add all the sides up and divide by 2 to get the semi-perimeter. And then the area is just square root of the semi-perimeter times the semi-perimeter minus one side times the semi-perimeter minus another side times the semi-perimeter minus the third side. So for example, if we have a triangle with side lengths 13, 14, 15, we would say the semi-perimeter is 21, because 13 plus 14 plus 15 divided by 2. So the area is just 21, 
times 21 minus one side, 13, times 21 minus one side, 14, and then 21 minus 15. And then you can just simplify this. Okay, now we have another property. The in radius of a triangle is the radius of an inscribed circle. So if we have a triangle, an inscribed just means it touches the side, it touches all three sides. So this would be the inscribed circle of the triangle over here. And the in radius is just the radius of this circle. And the in center, you can probably guess, is the center of this circle. The area of a triangle using the in radius is the in radius times the semi perimeter, which is just half of the sum of the three sides. And notice that if we know the area of a triangle and its semi perimeter, you can use that to find the in radius. So, kind of working backwards, because A is RS, R is A over S. And for a right triangle, there's another special formula you can use, but this is not that important. So, we'll move on to circumradius. The circumradius, well, look, notice how in, in, in circle was the circle that's inscribed. Circumradius, circumcircle is the circle that's circumscribed. So, for example, in this triangle, this is the circumcircle because it passes, it's a circle that includes all three points of the triangle. And the circumradius is the radius of the circle, and the circumcenter is just the center of the circle. So a triangle with circumradius R has area ABC over 4R. And notice that you can also use this to, if you use this formula backwards, you can use it to find the circumradius based on the area. And sometimes you might have to use Heron's formula to find the area in this because you, if you know the three sides. Now special triangle. An equilateral triangle, well, if the side length of an equilateral triangle is A, the height of the triangle is root three by two times A. And this follows from 30, 60, 90 triangles we'll talk about in just a second. Area of an equilateral triangle, which this is very important, root three by four times side length squared. So an area of an equilateral triangle with side length two is root three over four times two squared, which is just root three. Now 45, 45, 90 triangle. The triangle with three angles, 45, 45, and 90. And this will be an isosceles triangle. And the hypotenuse of a 45, 45, 90 triangle is root two times each of the legs squared. So in this diagram over here, as you can see, it's a 45, 45, 90 triangle. Each of these legs, let's say has length A, the hypotenuse has length root two times A. And the area, you can just use half base times height, half times A times A, because this is the height of the triangle, right? 45, 45, 90, size is ratio one to one to root two. And another property of, in general, isosceles triangles, this is also important, that if you have an isosceles triangle, if two of the sides are equal, then the angles must be equal, those base angles. And if those two base angles are equal, if two base angles are equal, then the two sides are equal. So if you, one implies the other. The two sides are equal, the angles are equal. The angles are equal, the sides are equal. So that's an extension of the 45, 45, 90 triangle. Next is the 30, 60, 90 triangle. So 30, 60, 90 triangle, three, let's say we have two legs of the 30, 60, 90 triangle. The long leg is root three times the short leg and the hypotenuse is two times the short leg. And the ratio of the sides is one to root three to two in a 30, 60, 90 triangle. And this is definitely worth knowing. Next off, we have Pythagorean theorem. A right triangle with legs A and B and hypotenuse C satisfies A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Now, this is very useful, but sometimes it's useful to know Pythagorean triples, which are three numbers that form that can be the side lengths of a right triangle. So some common ones are 3, 4, 5, 5, 12, 13, 7, 24, 25, 8, 15, 17. So for example, if a problem gives you that a triangle has three sides, let's say that's 3, 4, 5, you immediately know it has to be a right triangle since 3, 4, 5 is a Pythagorean triple. And also, for example, if we have three numbers that are part of a Pythagorean triple, if we multiply all those numbers by a constant, they'll also form a Pythagorean triple. So 3, 4, 5 is a Pythagorean triple, 6, 8, 10 is a Pythagorean triple, 9, 12, 15, so on. You can multiply all the sides by some constant. Those three will also be sides of a right triangle, 6, 8, 10, right. Next off, we have special properties of right triangles. So this is a cool one. 
if we have a right triangle and then we draw the, drop the altitude or the height to the hypotenuse like that, then there's a few special properties. This, this over here times this over here equals this squared. So CD times CD times AD equals BD squared. And another special property is that we have CD times CA equals CD squared, and we have DA times AC is AB squared. And this is just a shortcut, and you can actually derive this with similar triangles, which we'll talk about soon. Now, triangle properties, a CVN is any line connecting a vertex of a triangle to the opposite side. So for example, this is a, is a CVN, connects a point to some point on the opposite side. A median is a type of CVN, specifically one that connects it to the midpoint of the other side. This is the midpoint, let's say, and this over here is the median. And a centroid is the intersection of all three medians. So notice that there's not just one median in a triangle. There's three of them. Because there's three from all three points to the opposite side. And this, they'll all, all three of them will intersect at this point called the centroid. And there's a special property of centroids is that this will be the ratio of this to the whole median is two thirds. And that's pretty cool. Okay, next we're gonna talk about median in a right triangle. So median in a right triangle, there's a special property that this over here is equal to this over here is equal to this over here, where P is the midpoint. So this equals this equals this, if a, B, P is a median. Now angle bisector theorem states that AB over BD equals AC over CD in a triangle if these two angles are equal. So AD is considered to be an angle bisector because it cuts the angle in half. And with that comes a special property, this over this equals this over this. Now square, we all know, has area times side length squared and perimeter four times side length. And rectangle has area base times height and perimeter two times base plus two times height. Rhombus has area half times the product of the diagonal, and you can understand this by drawing a big box around it. Notice that the area is just half, because it's one half of this piece. So half times the product of the diagonal for a rhombus. A parallelogram is area base times height. Remember, height is not this side length, it's the thing that's perpendicular to the base. Area of a trapezoid is B1 plus B2 divided by 2 times H. So average of bases times height. And then some circle, er circle area is pi r squared. Circle circumference is 2 pi r. And let's say we have an arc of angle a degree. The area of a sector is pi r squared times a over 360. And the length of that arc is 2 pi r times a over 360. OK, next off, we have congruent triangles. So for congruent triangles, all of the angles of the triangle are the same all of these sides are equal, and all properties inside the triangle, like height, circumradius, in radius, those will also be the same as well. So it's not just side length, it's also height, altitude, area, perimeter, everything about it, because they're congruent. And two triangles are congruent. There's some congruence tests we have. There's AAS, where we have two angles that are equal and then a side. So if we have two angles and then a side we know are equal, they're congruent. SAS, which is Two sides are equal and an angle in between. SAS congruence, these triangles will be congruent. SSS congruence, so if we have two triangles that all have the same side length. So let's say there's a triangle here, one, two, three, one, two, let's say one, two, one point five as a side length. And this one also has one, one point five, two. These two triangles are congruent. And then for right triangles specifically, HL, so hypotenuse and if the hypotenuse and leg are equal for two triangles, their, con their triangles are congruent, and leg length too. So two right triangles, if the two legs are equal, so they're congruent as well. And warning that SSA, so if we have two sides equal and an angle equal, they're not necessarily going to be congruent. Notice that this, ex this picture explains why. Notice that these two triangles, side equal, 
side equal and angle equal. So FSA, but it's not a valid triangle congruence. As you can see, these triangles are not congruent. Now similar triangles. Two triangles are similar if the three angles in a triangle are the same, but not necessarily the side lengths. So it's essentially the same shape multiplied by a scale factor. And in general, triangles are similar if you have two angles equal, there's AA similarity, there's SAS similarity. So if you have two triangles that have the ratio of, of this side to this side is equal to the ratio of this side to this side, and the angle in between is equal, the triangles are similar. SSS, so the ratio of the three sides of the triangle are equal, the ratio of this to this equals the ratio of this to this equals the ratio of this to this, then the triangles are similar. And similarly, we also have HL, so height ratio of height of hypotenuse is equal to the ratio of legs in a right triangle and the ratio of the two legs are equal then the triangles are similar and for similar triangles all the angles are the same all the sides have the same ratio so if the scale factor is half then the sides will all be half as big and the, this is another key property the area ratio is the square of the side length ratio and remember, SA is, SA, SSA does not mean similar triangles. And an easy way to detect similar triangles is looking at parallel lines. And similar triangles is often hidden. So you have to, and to find similar triangles, oftentimes you'll have to do a little bit of angle chasing using the angle property we just learned. And then you'll use that to find similar triangles, which can give us side length ratios we can use to solve our problem. Okay, now we're going to move on to hexagon. The sum of the interior angles of a hexagon, we already know 720 by our formula. We know all these angle chasing properties already, but the key thing is that we can divide a hexagon, a regular hexagon, into six equilateral triangles. Notice here, we have six equilateral triangles. And each of them, and the area of a hexagon is just six times root three over four sides squared. Notice that this is just the formula for area of an equilateral triangle. And there's six of them. So it's just six times root three over four side squared. And also the length of the diagonal of a he regular hexagon is two times the side length. For octagon, we already know these properties from angle chasing. The area of octagon is two times one plus root two times the side length squared. And you can find this out by dividing this up like this and then using 45, 45, 90 triangles. That would give you the area of an octagon if you forget this formula. Length of complex shapes. So sometimes you'll have complex shapes and you'll have to find the length of them. So basically some tricks that you can do is look out for Pythag's theorem. So look out for 90 degree angles. Having equal angles means equal length by our isosceles triangle property that I described earlier. And sometimes you have to do tricky techniques like drawing extra lines, extending lines, and dropping altitudes. So if you have a triangle, it can be helpful to just drop an altitude. That can give you many useful properties. And these can create many things like similar triangles, special triangles, etc. Okay, so now we're going to move on to 3D geo. And also for complex, if you're trying to find the area of complex shapes, let's say you have a complex shape like this, for example. Notice that it's not a triangle, square, or whatever. So the trick is sometimes you have to break it up into regions, like we broke this up into a bunch of triangles, and sometimes you have to subtract the extra regions. So another way to find the area of this octagon is to take the big square and subtract the area of the four triangles. And similarly, for this thing I can drew to find its area, you just find the area of this triangle and subtract the area of this. So being on the lookout for these complex shapes and how you can just break it up or find the area of something bigger and subtract off the extra area. And a cube. So the volume of a cube is side length cubed. The surface area is six times side length squared. And the space diagonal, which is the diagonal from two opposite points, is root three times the side length. In a rectangular prism, the volume is length times base times height, and the surface area is two times length times base plus base times height plus length times height. In the length of a space diagonal, you can just use Pythag theorem twice, the square root of L squared plus B squared plus H squared, length, base, height. The volume of any prism is the base area times height, and the surface area of any prism a prism is basically a, a 3D shape which the top two base, top and bottom bases are parallel. So for example, this is an example of a prism where if we have 
You can imagine a rectangular prism as one type of prism, but that top shape does not necessarily have to be a rectangle. It can be a, it can be a hexagon, it can be a octagon, it can be any other irregular shape. That will be a prism. And to find the volume of a prism, all you do is you multiply the base area times the height. And a prism fundamentally is defined to have two bases that are parallel. And the surface, the surface area of a prism is just two times the base area plus the, this should say surface area, by the way, is two times the base area plus the base perimeter times the height. So if you have a triangular prism, you can imagine the surface area of this prism is just two times the base area, two times the base area, plus the base perimeter times the height. And for pyramid, it's one third times base area times height. So for example, this is a regular square pyramid, and the volume of a regular square pyramid is root two by six times side length cubed, and the volume of a tetrahedron, which is a trigonal pyramid, is root two over 12 times side length cubed. Now for cylinder, the volume is pi times r squared h. The surface area is 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r h, where r is the radius and h is the height. And cone, the volume is 1 third pi r squared h. And the surface area of a cone is just pi r squared plus pi r s, where s is the slant height. And you can find the slant height by doing Pythag theorem with r and h. That will give you the slant height, this over here. And also a cool trick is cone unfolding. You can unfold a cone into a, a sector like this. And you can unfold it into a sector such that this radius of the sector is the slant height of the cone. And this over here represents the circumference of the base. The, le the length of this arc is the circumference of the base of the cone. Okay, so sphere has volume 4 thirds pi r cubed and surface area 4 pi r squared. Now let's move on to number theory. Primes. So primes are number that are divisible by one in itself. They only have two factors. And it's recommended to memorize the first few primes, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, 29, 31, 37. You can memorize more if you want, but I highly recommend you know these first few primes. Now we have divisibility rules. So for two, the last digit has to be even. For three, the sum of digits must be divisible by three. For four, the last two digits are divisible by four. Five, last digit is zero or five. Six, for it to be divisible by six, you, you just use these two divisibility rules. It has to be divisible by both two and three. For seven, you just take out factors of seven until you reach a small number that's either divisible or not divisible by seven. Like for example, if you have something like two, two, 40, you just subtract multiples of seven. So you do two, two, 40, Oh, 2100 is 7 times 300. So we're left with 140. Oh, 140? Wait, that's, we can subtract off 140. Since 140 is 7 times 20, we get 0. So it's a multiple of 7. For 8, the last three digits must be divisible by 8. For 9, the sum of digits is divisible by 9. For 10, the last digit is 0. And for 11, there's a cool trick here. Let's say we have a number 1, 3, 3, 4. So to find out whether this number is divisible by 11, you take the odd, the sum of the odd number digits, which, which is not the odd digits, but the odd number digits. So the first digit, the third digit, and if there's more digits, the fifth, the seventh digit, and so on. So the first digit is one, the third digit is three. So the odd sum is four, and the sum of the even digits, so three and four. So the even sum is five, seven. So notice that it's not the even number digits, but the ones that are, the first and third in the, in the positionally, or, and second and fourth positionally, those will be the, that will be the even sum, and these two will be the odd sum. Right, not odd digits, but the odd position digits. So the first digit, the third digit, the second digit, the fourth digit. For 12, must be by three and four. 15, must be divisible by three and five. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to prime factorization. And prime factorization is just a way to express a number as product of primes. And you can do this by just dividing out and testing different primes. 21 is three times seven, prime factorization. 60 is two squared times three times five. And it might be good to know 2023's prime factorization memorized. It's seven times 17 squared. 
Now, Lee Jonder's theorem. Lee Jonder's theorem basically states, this is a super complicating looking formula, I know. Basically, let's say we have an, a 37 factorial. And remember that factorial is just, 37 factorial is just 1 times 2 times 3 times 4, all the way till 37. That's all. The n factorial is the product of all the numbers from 1 to n. The 37 factorial, let's say we're trying to find the number of factors of 3 in 37 factorial. To do this, we do 37 divided by 3 is 12. Then we do 12 divided by 3 is 4. Notice that we're, we remove all the decimals. So 37 divided by 3 is 12 and something, but we're only looking at integers here. So we just remove, remove the decimal. Then we do 12 divided by 3 is 4. 4 divided by 3 is, is 1 point something, but we only care about integers here, so 1. And then when you reach 0, you, you're done. And then finally, all you do is you add all these values up. Okay, now the number of factors of a number trick. Basically, if you have a prime number that can be expressed as a prime factorization, Let's take an example. We have 2 to the 5 times 3 to the 7. The number of factors of this number is just 5 plus 1, which is 6, times 7 plus 1, 8. So you just add 1 to all the exponents and multiply when you have the prime factorization. And the sum of factors formula, and the, again, this look, might look scary, but it's just saying, let's say we have 2 squared times 3 times 5. For each prime, let's say 2, we just do 1 plus 2 plus 2 squared, right? Because we go up till 2 squared. For 3, we do 1 plus 3. And for 5, we just do 1 plus 5. So we just keep going. And notice that 1 is just 2 to the 0, 3 to the 0, and 5 to the 0. So we just keep adding up all those factors of all those powers of 5, and you multiply them all together. The product of the factors of a number, let's say there's a number n, which has f factors, which we can calculate using d formula. We just discovered, right? This formula. So we, you, let's, just, let's use the same example. 2 to the 5 times 3 to the 7. How would we find the product of the factors? We already discovered that this has 48 factors. So the product of factors is just this number to the power of the number of factors divided by 2. This would be the product of factors. Now, obviously, it's going to be a big number because we're multiplying a bunch of things. And GCD LCM. So the product of GCD and LCM of two numbers is equal to the product of the two numbers. So GCD of 3 and 15 times LCM of 3 and 15, for example, is equal to just 3 times 15. And this is true for any two numbers. And this is very crucial. And some more properties, GCD AC, BC is just, you can factor out the C, so C times GCD AB. So like 3 times 5, 7 times 5 GCD is just 5 times GCD of 3 times 7, for example. Three, not three, like GC. We just basically can factor out a prime and it will just be five times that GC. And also the LCM has the same property. LCM of AC and BC is just, you can take out the C and, and then just do C times the LCM of A and B. Okay, this is very important, this next one. If a number is divisible by two numbers A and B, it will also be divisible by their LCM. So let's say it's divisible by four and nine then it must be divisible by LCM for 9. Not necessarily product, but LCM. Maybe you can also try, if let's say we know a number is divisible by 8 and 20, then it must be divisible by their LCM as well. Not necessarily product, be careful. Okay, and Euclidean algorithm basically states that if you have GCD x, y, we can just subtract off multiples of y, and those GCDs will be equal. So for example, GCD of 131, let's say 133 and 38 is just is equal to the GCD of 133, and now we can subtract off multiples of 38 and 38. And these are equal. And the good part about this is we can keep doing this until we get super small numbers and evaluate that manually. So it's useful for evaluating big GCDs. And going back to the divisibility here, remember all these divisibility rules? Well, they're very useful for those digit problems. Let's say you have 3AB, 4C is divisible by 5, 6, and 8. So to, to do these types of problems, just look at each of the divisibility conditions separately and see what it tells you. So look at divisible by 8. What does it tell you? Last three digits divisible by 8. And each of them will give you different information about the variables. 
and then you use this to find the solve for the variable. So it won't just be find is this number divisible by by eight or something. It will be there'll be more unique and fun problems that involve having to use these divisibility rules backwards. Okay, so now we're going to move on to modular arithmetic. So what is modular arithmetic? With a number, let me say a number a is equivalent to b mod n if they leave the same remainders when divided by n. So for example, 37 is equivalent to 1 mod 3. What does this mean? Well, 37 leaves a remainder of 1 when divided by 3. 1 leaves a remainder of 1 when divided by 3. So they're congruent. Also, if a equals x mod n and b is y mod n, the product is just the product of their mods. So this is useful for, let's say, we, what is the remainder when 37 times 97 is divided by 3? Rather than multiplying it out, we just say, OK, 37 leaves a remainder of 1 when divided by 3, and 97 leaves a remainder of 1 when divided by 3. So their product will just be 1 times 1. That's the remainder when divided by 3. And this is also useful for when you're trying to calculate last few digits of an expression, which is just going to be, let's say, last, last digit will be mod 10, the remainder when divided by 10, last two digits mod 100, and so on. And next, if a is equal to x mod n, then we can just take their a to the power of any mod m and x to the power of any m. So a to the m equals x to the m mod n. So for example, 3 to the, let's say, 2 to the 5 equals 8 to the 5 or, or congruent mod 3. Because 2 and 8 are congruent mod 3. So that's also useful because we can set, let's say the question says, find the remainder when 37 to the 1997 is divided by 3. Now, obviously, you can't evaluate this, but 37 is 1 mod 3, so it's just 1 to the 1997, which is just 1 mod 3. So, cool little trick there. Now, we're going to move on to factorization. The difference of squares, x squared minus y squared is x minus y times x plus y. Now, these are some binomial square expansions. Basically, x plus y squared is x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. x minus y squared is x squared minus 2xy plus y squared. And these other ones can be useful too, but these are mainly the important ones you need to know. And Simon's favorite factoring trick, basically, well, let's say we have something like xy plus 3x plus 3y. We can factor this as x plus 3 times y plus 3 minus 9. Because notice that x plus 3 times y plus 3, if we expand it out, it's just xy plus 3x plus 3y plus 9. So, and that's, that's all that's saying. This is just expanded out version of this. But it's useful in these types of problems where we have xy plus 3x plus 3y. And then you just say x plus y. And then, okay, we need plus 3 plus 3 to get these 3x and 3y terms. But then there's the extra 3 times 3, 9 terms. So we rewrite it like this. And the difference of cubes and sum of cubes, you can look here, but they're not that useful for AMC8. So now we're going to move on to chicken McNugget theorem, which basically states that let's say you're saying, what is the maximum amount of money that can't be created with three and five cent coins? So to do this, you just plug it into this formula. You just take their product, three times five, minus their sum. And this is seven. So seven is the maximum amount of money that cannot be made with three and five cent coins. So everything beyond that, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, so on, they can all be made with three cent and five cent coins. Now let's move on to combinatorics. The number of ways of arranging n objects in a line is just n factorial, right? And permutations, so if we're trying to order k objects out of n total objects, we denote this as npk, it's n factorial over n minus k factorial. So let's say we're trying to find the number of ways to order three objects from eight objects. This is just eight, eight factorial over eight minus five factorial. So because let's say we're trying to order five objects from eight objects, it's just this quantity here, 8 factorial over 8 minus 5 factorial. And this actually just simplifies to 8 times 7 times 6. And these types of problems, oftentimes you can't just use the permutations formula. The, tr the trick is to consider it choice by choice. So let's say we're choosing three menu items for a food. You consider each of them separately and see how many choices they have and multiply them together. Now circular arrangements, if we're arranging n objects in a circle, it's n minus 1 factorial. If rotations are of the same arrangements are not considered distinct. Now, let's say reflections are also not considered distinct. So if you have an arrangement, you reflect it, it's the same thing. 
Then we just divide by an additional factor of two. Now combination. Now these are objects that are unordered. So let's say we're choosing k objects out of n. So there's a very important distinction between these two. Let's say we're, we have a menu of 10 items and we're, we have to choose three different items in a given order. That's a permutation. But let's say we're just choosing, picking three items off the menu to eat in any order. That's a combination. And generally, you have to look out for these keywords. Choose, select, those mean combination. Versus permute, order, those are more for permutation. And there's a big distinction. So for combinations, the number of ways is we say it's n choose k, which is n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial. So for example, 8 choose 3, which is the number of ways of choosing three objects out of eight. So let's say we have eight pencils, we're trying to choose three of them to take. That's eight choose three. And this is just eight factorial over three factorial, five factorial. And then we just do some factorial simplifications by canceling out five factorial from the eight factorial term to get this. Now binomial identity states that n choose zero plus n choose one all the way till n choose n is two to the n. And that's, that's useful because sometimes Let's say we ask the question, there's 10 different toppings to put on a pizza. How many ways are there to put the topping? The, the idea for this is that for each topping, you have two choices, put it or not to put it. So it's just, the answer is just two to the power of 10. Now we have the word rearrangement formula. So the type of questions where let's say we have a word and we're trying to find how many different rearrangements of the letter of this word are possible. And for this type of problem, so the idea is you just take the number of letters of the word factorial and divide it by the number of duplicates factorial. So for example, let's say our word was paper. So we have five letters, so five factorial over, notice how there's two Ps, so we divide by two factorial because, well, there's two Ps and P appears twice. So for each letter that appears more than once, you divide by the number of times it appears that factorial. And you divide all that from the number of the total number of letters factorial. So in this case, it's just five factorial over two factorial. But if there was, let's say, another E at the end, let's say we're trying to order this, this over here, then you would take five factorial divided by two factorial and another two factorial since there's two E's. And sometimes you might have conditions with that with word rearrangements as well. And the tricks are doing that. Is just grouping and treating the, the block method. So let's say you, you, you're given that a few letters must remain together. You just say they're a block, and then you rearrange the letters of the word with that block intact. So probability is just successful outcomes over the total number of outcomes. A principle of inclusion exclusion is just some really fancy notation. Don't worry too much about it. All it's saying is that let's say you're trying to count the things where two different things happen. But actually, before we talk about this, let's talk about casework. So casework is a strategy where it's so useful. Let's say you have a common notorious problem where there's different cases. So you break up the problem into multiple cases, and you do each of those separately using permutations, combinations, whatever. And complementary counting is counting the opposite of what you have, subtracting it from the total number of outcomes. And this is useful because, especially when there's at least in the word. So let's say how many ways are there to roll at least one, at least two heads when you flip, at least at least two heads when you flip three pair of coins. To do that, you just you count the opposite what you don't want, and then you subtract that from the possibilities where the total number of possibilities. You're counting the complement. And and now let's move on to principle inclusion exclusion. So let's say you're trying to find the the number of multiples of three or two less than 100. To do this, you just find the number of multiples of two less than 100, you find the number of multiples of three less than 100, and you subtract the multiples of both three and two because they're being overcounted. And for three events, it's something similar. Let's say it's now number of multiples of two, three, or five less than 100. To do this, you just find the number of multiples of two less than 100, three less than 100, five less than 100, and you subtract the number of multiples of two and three less than 100, the number of multiples of two and five less than 100, and three and five less than 100, and then you add back the multiples of two, three, and five, which is, which is just going to be a multiple of 30 less than 100. So that's all this giant complicated formula is saying. 
Now stars and bars. The number of ways of placing n objects in k bins is n plus k minus 1 choose n. And this is only useful when the objects are indistinguishable. So let's say that this is only useful when we have, let's say, seven identical candies that we're distributing. If the candies are different, then stars and bars doesn't work. We'll have to use principal inclusion exclusion. So the number of ways of placing an object in the k bins, well, the trick for this is you have n objects. Let's say we have five candies. We're giving to three kids. So what we do is, because there's three kids, we can place two bars, because then we have three regions for the three kids. And then the number of ways of ordering this the sequence of, of symbols, we just say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven of these kind of letters, and then we choose two of them to be bars. So seven choose two. And you can memorize this formula or just understand the logic behind it. And by the way, all these concepts I'm covering very quickly right now, but I covered in much more detail in many of the other classes. You can find links to them in the description below. I've covered these with many examples and simple exa and tricky applications, so you get a much better understanding of these. Okay, now geometric counting. So the number of squares in an n by n grid of squares is just 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared all the way till n squared. So let's say how many squares are in this grid. You just say 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared because it's a 3 by 3 grid of squares. And the number of rectangles of all sizes, well, this is a cool trick. You just say add 1 to the, each of the dimensions, and you do n plus 1 choose 2 times n plus 1 choose 2. And the reason is because you can imagine in an n by n grid, there's n, n plus 1 of these lines and n plus 1 of these lines. So it's just n plus 1 choose 2 times n plus 1 choose 2. Okay, and also a pathfinding problem. So the number of ways from going from 0, 0, and n, if, you're, if you can only move up and right, this is just n plus n choose n. And the, the reason is because you can say r, you can imagine you have to move right n times, and up n times, and then you just use the word rearrangement formula, which simplifies to this. Now we're moving on to algebra. So algebra, work is equal to rate times time. Rate is work times divided by time. Time is work by rate. Those are just, and in general, for these types of problems, it's often good to assign unknowns to be variables and then solve the equation. This is super common on the AMCA. And let's say one person can do something in, let's say, A hours, and someone else can do it in B hours. Together, they can do it in AB divided by A plus B hours, working together. So for, let's say someone can, can finish something in three hours and some, somebody else can finish in five hours. Together, they can finish in three times five over three plus five hours. And this is not only true for work, like I said here. Now systems of equations, there's a quadratic formula to solve a quadratic, negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. And there's also ways to factor quadratics that I'm not going to cover in this video for the sake of time. Now we have speed distance time. Distance is speed times time, speed is distance by time, and time is distance over speed. And, and oftentimes these problems are not going to be direct applications. They're going to involve, you have to let the speed, you have to assign variables and just solve for those variables in a system of equations. Again, I covered that in a much more detailed in another video on my channel, many other videos. So average speed is just total distance by total time. Remember, you cannot just average both the speeds. You have to take total distance by total time. You cannot just say like, oh, 30 miles per hour from a point there and 50 miles per hour back, so average speed is 40. That's not how it works. You have to take total distance by total time and use these formulas along with it. Arithmetic sequences. And its term of an arithmetic sequence is the first term plus n minus one times the common difference. And we also have the number of terms in an arithmetic sequence is the last term minus the first term divided by the common difference plus one. And the average of a term in the arithmetic sequence is just the sum of the first, the, is just the average of the first and last terms. And the sum of the terms in an arithmetic sequence is just the average of the first and the last term times the number of terms. So for example, if you have an arithmetic sequence three, seven, 11, all the way till let's say 37, 
30, uh, let's say up till 39. Well, what we can do is, if we're trying to find the sum of all the terms in this arithmetic sequence, what we can do is say that how many terms are in the arithmetic sequence? Well, you first term minus last term, I mean, last term minus first term divided by the common difference, which is four. So that's nine. And then we do plus one to get 10. And now that there's 10 terms of the arithmetic sequence, average of the terms is three plus, it's just the average of the first and last term, which is 21. And then we say, okay, this is the average and 10 is the number of terms. So 21 times 10 is the sum. The sum of numbers formula, the sum of all the numbers from one to n is n times n plus one by two. The sum of the odd numbers from let's say one to two n minus one is n squared. The sum of the even numbers, so from let's say two to two n is just n times n plus one. And these are some more advanced formulas. Geometric sequence. The nth term of a geometric sequence is just the first term times the common ratio to the power of n minus one, where there's n terms, where this is the nth term. And the sum of terms in a geometric sequence is the first term times one minus the common ratio to the power of n divided by one minus the common ratio. And an infinite geometric sequence, the sum is just the first term over one minus the common ratio. So for example, one plus one third plus one ninth plus so on is just the first term over one minus the common ratio and this equals three halves. Now mean, means, and mode, you probably already know, mean is the average of all the terms, sum divided by number, mode is the most common, median is the middle number, but the key thing, and range is just the highest minus the smallest number, but the problems are not gonna be straightforward. They're gonna involve, let's say you have a sequence list of numbers, you use the mean and median, you might have to do a little bit of casework based on that, find out the values. Telescoping. So for telescoping, it's just mass cancellation. So for telescoping, the trick is, it's Expand the first two terms and last two terms and just cancel out any terms you see. Here's a classic application. Let's say you're trying to find one half times two thirds times three fourths all the way till nine, nine, nine over a thousand. How will you do this? Well, notice that we can, a bunch of terms will cancel out. Notice that two cancels with two, three cancels with three, the, the four over here will cancel with four, so on all the way till nine, nine, eight will cancel and nine, nine, nine will cancel. So we're just left with one over a hundred because everything will cancel. So look for these types of cancellations whenever you've got a really giant sequence. So now you know all the most important formulas, but applying them is not always easy. I covered many applications of these formulas in the Mastering AMC8 series, how you can apply these formulas to tricky and unique situations. You can check that out in this playlist over here.